Diagnosis, decision making, and implementation. I'm here to talk to you about a better way to solve your next problem. And for those of you who haven't had it happen already, at some point in your life, you're going to be asked to solve a really tough problem. And maybe even one that someone has failed at before you. I'm going to teach you a powerful problem solving method I learned during my time in the MBA. So, when you're dealing with a really tough problem, first ask yourself what is the situation? Write out a problem statement and define the various actors and outside forces putting pressure on that situation. So, for example, how many kids, when you're faced with a tough decision, it could be a small one like what kind of cereal to buy for your kids? Or it could be a large problem, like how to design a plane that uses less fuel. So when you're dealing with that situation and you're asking how, what cereal I should buy for my kids, know how old they are, how many you have, and why they even need breakfast. After situation analysis, bring in an analytical method or several to help model how that problem is structured. So for example, should you evaluate cereal based on its nutrition, its price, or the time that it takes to prepare? After analysis, options. Now you can start mapping out the various options. Establish a range of options and map out their pros and cons. Think widely of possible options. So what, for example, if you bought nutritional cereal and paired it with chocolate milk? What about porridge? Is that a cereal? After options, pick a recommendation and move forward with it. Hopefully, it's going to be the one with the most amount of pros or the least amount of cons. After your recommendation, give it an implementation plan. And that means sticking it to a schedule, giving it a scope and a budget. Ensure that you lay out all the key resources and activities that you need. How are you going to get to the store? By car, by bus? How much money and time are you going to need? And last, map out your risks or your pitfalls, things that can go wrong. And map them out by their probability and impact. And that ensures that your mitigation strategies are balanced between their potential consequences of a complicating factor and how likely they might be to occur. So for example, in, in going to buy cereal at the store, what's the likelihood of getting struck by lightning versus forgetting your wallet? Now, by taking these steps, you're going to feel confident that you've not only chosen the right cereal, but you're actually going to be able to get it to your kids for breakfast. Situation, analysis, options, recommendation, implementation, and risks. During my time in the Masters of Business program at the University of Alberta, I had the opportunity to participate in case competitions. So as a team of four MBA candidates, we would go up against other teams to solve emerging business problems. So here I am uh, winning first place. This is my team with a strategic, at a strategic marketing competition. And here we are after winning at the Ivy School of Business at a leadership case competition. And we recommended how to centralize and socialize a corporate IT strategy for a firm that grew through multiple M&As. Here we are at a sustainability case competition where we won first place on a topic of impact investment. And here we are winning a strategy case at the Haskane School of Business. Collectively, our teams won over $13,000 in winnings during my time in the program. And we beat out schools like Ivy, Rotman, Schulich, and Queens, among others, just by applying this model. Situation, analysis, options, recommendation, implementation, and risks. So in between the two years of study, I was lucky to do a summer internship for the Downtown Business Association, where I was presented with a real world problem. I was asked to look into the negative brand perceptions of downtown. And that matters because how goes your downtown, so goes your city. So to illustrate how this worked with a real situation, that's exactly what I started with. And the situation was that downtowns across North America suffered branding problems tied to similar issues, crime, dirt, and parking. And the second important part of the situation is that Edmonton's downtown had been slowly revitalizing, and too many were unaware of those recent improvements. So next, we started doing some analysis, and we looked at disciplines that really mattered when brand attitude seemed stuck in negativity. One piece of analysis that was important was looking at the science behind why myths are tenacious. And the research shows that when we're presented with information that challenges deeply held beliefs, like downtown isn't cool, 
We need to sidestep how the brain understands information in order to challenge those outdated beliefs. Second was bringing in research from place branding and how predict practitioners use change models to market places instead of products. With defining and analyzing the situation out of the way, we moved on to our third step, which was examining our options. And we looked for options of data-driven transformation that we could use to build a better brand story. From a full set of options, we were able to recommend and implement communication materials built around data proof points that told the story of revitalization in a new way. So in collaboration with Zag Creative, we launched a series of graduated materials that people could explore what revitalization meant for Edmonton's downtown. The approach proved successful, and in addition to generous media coverage, the project was recognized by the International Downtown Association for the marketing approach we took. It was the first time that the DBA had been recognized for a summer project. But I want you to know that this method doesn't always guarantee success. And I remember the competitions that I've lost because it's not like we use this method any differently. So I've been thinking about what it is that you need to know to apply it effectively. And to pinpoint what that is, I'm going to tell you a personal story about where good problem solving comes from. After spending some time learning Russian in eastern Ukraine on an Alberta education grant, I interned with the Aga Khan Development Agency on a project called the University of Central Asia, which has campuses in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. I spent most of my time in Kyrgyzstan, and if you don't know where that is, I don't blame you. It's literally as far away as you can get from Edmonton on the other side of the earth. It's a place that most people would describe as off the beaten path. I worked with the English faculty there, and one of my tasks was to help evaluate a program called English in the Villages. It was a feeder program that supported English classes across the country from elementary up, so by the time students came out of high school, they could study in English at the university. You can imagine the challenge in trying to bring a post-Soviet education system up to a global standard. And when I went out and visited these classrooms, it was a lot like what you'd expect. Teachers who struggled with their own level of fluency were struggling to generate meaningful learning outcomes for their students. The most common piece of feedback that I heard from teachers was that they didn't have the right resources, followed by not enough time, followed by not enough access to fluent English speakers. So on the last day, we had one place left to visit. And you have to imagine me getting crammed into a Soviet Lada, which is a type of car with a Peace Corps worker and a couple faculty staff. And we start driving way out into the mountains. And we're literally driving from dawn to dusk the whole day. And at some point, we're off the beaten path into the middle of nowhere. And up pops this tiny little village. And so when we arrive, we head out to the school. And the teacher's really excited to see us because her students have never met a native English speaker. After a short presentation in the classroom, she asks on their behalf if they could just come up to us and ask us some questions and test out their skills. And of course, we were happy to oblige. Now, can you guess what their first question was? These students' first question was, how do you define happiness? Their next question was, do you think that trade liberalization is good or bad for Kyrgyzstan? And so they peppered us with these questions, one right after the other, and we were blown away. Needless to say, we had a rich discussion with these students, and we were so impressed because their level of comprehension and accents were simply incredible. We had just visited a dozen locations, and to say that this was an outlier would be a huge understatement. And of course, we went back to that teacher, and we asked her, what's going on? And what she described was not a plea for more resources, time, or access to fluent English speakers. She described herself as a facilitator. And what she did was have kids develop their own teaching tools. So they had developed a library of things like picture books that they had hand drawn, explaining what words meant in English, songs written in English, depending on the interests of the student. And instead of lecturing her students in broken English, she had a cassette tape which she played conversational exercises over and over again for her students to build off of. The result was that she was able to solve this really hard problem of teaching a language that she didn't really know with limited resources. 
And she was able to do this in a way that saw her students far surpass her own skills. She saw a solution where no one else had. And it pulls me back to situation analysis, options, recommendation, implementation, and risks. So which part was she really good at? The reason I'm telling you this story is because what makes a winning team and what makes a good problem solver is being able to do the options part right. The more skilled you are at developing a quantity and quality of options, the better your recommendation is going to be, the better your implementation plan is going to be. What leads people to fail in approaching tough problems is a myopic view of what the solution can be and not thinking creatively about the range of options. Creativity is truly the most undervalued skill in business. And what this teacher was able to do was explore that range of options with her students. So to build on this, I'm going to share with you a perspective put forth by Owen Barter, a development theorist whose work I loved when studying international economic development. Owen Barter points out that adaptability, being experimental in the options you put forth when solutioning, is a powerful way to problem solve. And he tells this great story about anthropologist, evolutionary anthropologist Steve Jones. And Steve Jones was brought in to help improve a nozzle that crystallized soap powder for an industrial process at Unilever. So fluid dynamics is nonlinear, and engineers were struggling to design improvements. And his approach was radically different. He took the current nozzle, which looks something like this, and created 10 random distorted copies. And he tested those. And he chose the best one out of those 10. And he kept going and going through several iterations. And after 45 generations of iteratively expounding on 10 different options, he had this rad-looking nozzle that was hundreds of times more efficient than the original, one that was beyond the imagination of engineers to deliver. His entire solution was options development. The takeaway is that you should have an open mind and experimental attitude. That's the key to greater success in problem solving. So how can you make your options work? There's two things I've learned that I'm going to teach you today that you can start applying right away in terms of making options work. The first is that you need to lay out more than six possible options when you're dealing with complex situations. We can call that the rule of the hand that you have to think creatively beyond the number of fingers on one hand to be effective at problem solving. So if you're buying cereal for the kids, that means you need at least six cereals to choose from before you pick one. The second thing, when doing options development, do not duplicate or overlap the content in your solutions. So ensure that each option is distinguished from each other. In business, we use a management consulting principle called MISI, which stands for mutually exclusive, and collectively exhaustive. So don't pick six types of Cheerios. Try to think of a diverse range of possible cereal options. So to summarize, when you're dealing with a tough problem and you need to reboot, start by mapping out the situation, conducting some analysis, developing options, and ensuring your recommendation is fixed to an implementation plan that identifies some pitfalls or risks. I want you to remember that this is just one model I've showed you today. And you can even brainstorm or use your own model for problem solving. But whatever model you use, please put plenty of energy into mapping out lots of options that are both mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Because winning solutions are found in those unexpected options. So next time you go out and you buy cereal for the kids, do not limit those options. So many people get bogged down thinking about what you can't do. And the better way to solve your next problem is to think about what you can do. Thank you.